And uh, welcome, Suzanne. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. This is quite amazing. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I just wanted to say one thing up front was that I was so... I'm so grateful for to have an afternoon to look at everything that River Culture has accomplished over the last, you know, particularly five years. I think a lot of people in our position who always, you know, who do the kind of things that we do always has their nose down and they're just moving on to the next event, moving on to the next project. And to spend an afternoon just kind of looking at it um, to get these slides together, it was a real pleasure. And I thank you very much for having me. No, not at all. It's our pleasure. Um, we've had a long working relationship with um, the town of Montague through the River Culture Project, which was first funded through the Adams Arts Program. And I know, Suzanne, you're going to describe actually how, how this work has progressed over time. So let's get to it. Sure, sure, absolutely. Okay. All right, so if everyone's looking at the screen, um, so I am from the town of Montague. Montague has five villages, of which Turner's Falls is one of the five villages. Um, the other villages are Montague Center and Lake Pleasant and um, Montague City and Miller's Falls. So if you live in the area, you've heard all those, all of those uh, villages, but they are actually under the municipality of, of the town of Montague. And if you were to come in, um, in Franklin County, if you were to come in off of Route 2, you would come over the bridge, the newly um, the Turner, Gill Turner's Falls Bridge, and this is one of the views. So this is the view from um, the Turner's Falls Gill Bridge. Um, you can see that we have uh, a mill district in the background. On the left is the Great Falls Discovery Center. And in the bottom right, you can see a photograph of an aerial view, and you can see the canal that kind of comes through. Um, it's a 19th century canal, and the Connecticut River, which kind of goes around the whole outside and right over the bridge, right straight through to the middle of town. Um, there's 9,000 people in the town of Montague, of which 4,000 live in Turner's Falls, which is our main business district. Um, many of the people, um, it, was, it, was a, it was a mill town, and so like the story of a lot of mill towns, when the industry from the mills left, um, income went down, and so this river culture program was an effort, a successful effort, to um, introduce the creative economy into this former mill town. Um, in, in 2017, the Turner's Falls Cultural District received um, cultural district designation by the Mass Cultural Council, and we're very proud of that. Okay, next slide, Mary. Let's see what we've got. Oh, okay, and here are some of our amenities. So if you haven't been to town or you haven't been here in a while, we have an absolutely beautiful waterfront. Uh, at the top, is a, you'll see there's a front of a canoe. We have a um, the Come Talk Homelands Festival, which is a Native American event that we have every summer, the first Saturday in August. We have a gorgeous skate park, which was 20 years in the making, um, 20 years of fundraising and efforts by the community, a real grassroots effort. That's right at Unity Park as well. Um, we have the Shea Theater, which in the last two years has received several hundred thousand dollars worth of renovations and um, development. And we have a, it's a 300 seat theater, and we get um, entertainment, um, theater, and dance, music, obviously, comedy. We get everything. Um, and it's a regional, uh, beautiful regional theater. So if you haven't been here, keep an eye out for shows at the Shea. And then down on the lower left, we have our canal um, bike path. Um, the bike path is a really great resource for running and jogging and obviously biking, but it kind of um, encompasses the whole beltway around the canal district and ending up at Unity Park. And then in the lower right is the Great Falls Discovery Center. Um, the Great Falls Discovery Center is actually a DCR state park, and um, it's on four beautiful acres down, downtown and it exhibits um, the natural, cultural, and industrial history of the Connecticut River watershed. Um, but in spite of all of these beautiful attractions, Turner's Falls actually has very few venues to create art or to have a performer, performance. Um, and so it's, a, it's always been a real challenge for um, creative people in uh, Turner's Falls, and also for River Culture, where we're we going to do all of the amazing, uh, the amazing things that we want to do. So, next slide, Mary. So, um, 
so it's been a it's it's been a challenge to programming the lack of indoor space. We also don't have any refurbished mill space. We do have mills, but unfortunately, they have not had the kind of renovations that many communities enjoy. Um, so as a result of this situation, anyone with a space, so either the town or local businesses, restaurants, our state park, um, nonprofit organizations, everybody at some point has been asked to host an exhibit or a performance or a demonstration or any other cultural activity um, by River Culture. So in the, in the 10 years that we, like almost 12 years now that we have been um, having cultural activity down, had events just about anywhere that you can imagine. Um, it's a very Turner's Falls kind of thing to shoehorn an event or an exhibition or happening into an unconventional space. So this is a very early example. Um, this is the Lost and Found Fashion Show. Um, it was started by an artist in, the town, in, in town named Chris Janke about 12 years ago. Uh, Chris is a poet and an artist who bought a laundromat in downtown Turner's Falls. And he actually lived in the back, wrote poetry, and fixed machines. And one day he decided that what he wanted to do was to have a fashion show in which he used all the clothes that were left over in the laundromat for the last year. So he collected the clothes, they were redistributed to people who could sew, and he started this fashion show. And you can see um, a poster on the left by a local graphic designer and photographer named Anya Schutz. And on the top right, you'll see that the, um, you see that the fashion show, they actually walked right down the middle of the washers and dryers. Here's a, in the lower right, you'll see a woman. She's elevated. That's because they had built a runway right down the top of the washers. In fact, on the triple washers a few years ago, they actually put a rock band, and that was pretty cool. But um, um, Chris Jenke ha has been doing this for 12 years, and it's just a really early example of how Turner's Falls uses what it is that they have. Um, Next slide, please. This was a very interesting performance. This was in November 2010 when the, um, this was uh, the producer series. River Culture put on um, a series of events, um, performances, and um, Lisa Duvall, the former director, actually arranged to have this theater group come and perform inside of Food City. Um, if you look at the photo on the left, you can see the set that they have, and then you can see down aisle five. And it was a real, it was a quite an avant-garde performance. Um, and I have a description that I dug out of, of, um, out of her computer files, and it sounds so interesting. I wish I had attended. Um, it said, set in a time when people knew the difference between sacrifice and compromise and could differentiate between a robot and a walrus or a hole in the ice or the ice itself, this play functions as its own mini-series to highlight this remarkable period when everyone understood and knew how to use the 18-hand uh, movements prescribed by time motion study, posting big questions like, can inefficiency be cured? So it sounds like a really avant-garde performance, and we convinced, River Culture convinced um, the people at Food City to have it right there. So um, that is just another example, an early example of how Turner's Falls is starting to gain the reputation for putting programming in really unusual places. Okay, next slide, Mary. Oh, this is a fun place, and many of you who live in the Valley have probably been here. This is Nina's Nook. Nina's Nook is the smallest gallery in the Valley, maybe the state. It's five feet wide, and it's 20 feet long, and it's located between two buildings. Um, I think that this area was originally built just as storage for recycling for one or both of the businesses. Nina's had this space for seven years. And um, she's been hosting exhibitions ever since. Um, let's go to the next slide, please, and I'll show you a little bit what it looks like. Oh, the w picture on the right is what it looks like when she got it. Here's Nina in the back. There she is sitting in the back. Yes, yeah, so th the photo on the right is before, and here she is now. So she's been there for seven years, and she um, hosts exhibitions, monthly exhibitions, paintings, photography, sculpture, crafts, 
um, jewelry, and all this stuff is made by herself or many of her many local artists. So you can see, oh, and then the slide on the back is um, her garden area. So it's 20 feet long, but then in good weather, she can extend the exhibition. She can extend the exhibition to the backyard. She's there. Um, she has a beautiful exhibition up this month. Okay, next slide. So I took the position of Director of River Culture in late 2013. And in that spring, um, I started a project called the Avenue A Storefront Galleries. And we have had a large business downtown, a large building downtown that had four storefronts, and they were completely vacant, and they really looked quite bad. They were full of junk, um, and frankly, they were in kind of really a horrible need for a major renovation, but they were sitting there empty, um, and it just really dragged the whole town down, the look of the whole town. And it is also not a nice thing for families to walk by. It just really it was just really not a it was just not a good thing for the town. And so with a local business owner, Eric McLean, who many of you might know from Loot, the store down the street, we approached the art we approached the owner of the building with a plan um, that if we clean out the spaces the best that we can, would it be possible for River Culture to use the windows to present art? Um, I would be the only one allowed in the building in the end because obviously we didn't have insurance and these aren't gallery spaces in the traditional sense where people come inside, but would it be possible for us to do this, just to have things in the window? And um, to our surprise, he said yes. So the project only costs about $1,400. In the photo on the left, you'll see my friend David. He is raising, um, he's raising the base of that, of that window up so that we could put sculpture in there. And so all of the four storefronts received either some kind of treatment where it was a wall that was hinged so it could open up and we could put art on it and then close it back up, or there were other um, ways of blocking the space behind it. Um, and that was just very important because the spaces just looked so bad. And if we go on to the next space, I can show you what it kind of looked like. Here on the left are two students for Greenfield Community College and they had a group show in, in, in the first space. And you can see on the left, she's um, hammering up some of her photographs. She's hanging them. And then the, what would happen is then this whole thing would close. So the view of the back was blocked. And of course, it looked from the front just like a beautiful gallery space. Down here in the lower right, you'll see that same space with another artist, Rodney Madison. He had a solo show uh, one year. And, and in the upper space is another group show. So it cost it cost fourteen or fifteen hundred dollars to do, which paid for the labor and the lumber. Um, but inside of about three weeks, we turned this very um, kind of dirty, not so great looking place into what looks like four storefronts full of really beautiful art. And um, Usually the events were themed. If you go to the next slide, I think I have some. We showed photography, painting. We showed video. Um, many of the uh, many of the um, events were um, designed around a monthly exhibition. River Culture at that time was putting on third Thursday events, and the photograph at the top is from an event we had called Creature Feature. And we had video art by um, Torsten Zanus Burns, and then we had figures by Rob Kimmel. And so I had speakers outside. I ran some um, speakers that were kind of placed high in the space outside, and I could come down every day and with remotes turn on turn on the videos, and they would play for three or four hours a day, and people could stop and look and hear the videos. And so this is just a still from. Um, that event and that those artists. And then at the bottom is a back projection from It's a Wonderful Night, which is our holiday event. So we use these spaces in just about every way possible, photography, painting, video, um, back projection, you can see there. If you go on to the next one, let's see what we've got. Yes, this was a whole installation called Basement Suite for Troll Fest. 
um, we illuminated the entire window, not just the bottom part, but um, I created a video with the ambiguities, um, which is a local rock band, and we used the entire front of the building. I had two projectors going in there, and it was, you know, 10 feet high or something, 10 feet high and 20 feet wide. It was quite phenomenal to to activate the space in that way. And then in the right was a the right was a video collaboration with Miller's Falls Arts Bridge. Um, these artists were from China, and um, we had video for them as well, as in, including photography and sculpture. So in the two years that we had these gallery spaces, um, we had about 20 exhibitions in all um, media. And um, it was a very successful project. Um, it was a very successful project because it cleaned up the look of downtown. Um, it increased access to the arts for our residents, which was very important and is very important. Um, continues to be, and it increased opportunity for artists. We had about, like I said, almost 200 artists present work in one of the storefronts. We sold about $2,000 worth of art out of the storefronts that went um, directly to the artists. And, of course, it attracted um, tourism and new artists to the town. And very importantly, it was another venue for river culture to have programming because there's so little space in Turner's Falls, having these spaces um, having these spaces was really important to continue to drive programming. Um, let's go, let's see, let's go to the next slide. Where are we? Okay, and, and you know, kind of while it's anecdotal, this kind of buzz about Turner's Falls um, being an independent, this kind of buzz that's created by this project and all of the projects throughout the year, as Turner's Falls being like an independent, cult, um, the cultural activity that's going on there, um, started to attract a lot of um, creative entrepreneurs. We have two new restaurants in the town that have just come in over the last uh, three years. We have a brewery that's come in. We have an actual uh, cider maker that's come in just this last year. We have a very cool motorcycle shop that came in on 3rd Street. So they do, um, they do business uh, repairs and they sell vintage motorcycles. And so after 10 years of a lot of hard work, people are starting to respond to the quirky identity that Turner's Falls has built. Um, the renovation of the Shea, the $200,000 that's been re um, invested in the Shea since um, – in the, over the last two years, it's just kind of an announcement of the success. We just do different things differently here. Um, we put fashion shows and laundromats. We project uh, videos from empty storefronts, and we create building. We create space in between buildings for art if no other, if no other space exists. Um, it's it's this kind of unconventional attitude that has lended to the identity of Turner's Falls. And this identity that we have is, you know, in, in the end, it's the real driver of our creative economy, that we have an identity as an unusual place to live and work and create. And so here we have some new retail on Avenue A. So what I wanted to do is have you notice that these are the very same spots that I had the Avenue A storefront, the storefront galleries. And, it's yeah, of course, it's anecdotal that... I would have that river culture would have programming in these windows for two and a half years, and then somebody decided to come in and, and invest in the building and really renovate it properly. You know, it's not a direct correlation, but you have to kind of think that if river culture hadn't brought these spaces to life, if anybody driving by would even imagine that building could turn into this. So here's a new, um, as of about four months ago, a new home goods store called Stenhouse, and I recommend that you come. It's just gorgeous. And then next to it is a pinball place called Mystic Pinball, and in the lower right you can see some kids playing pinball. It's really fantastic. They have about 25 machines in there, all of them old-school pinball machines, and it's really, really fun. And then in the upper right, um, it's a new clothing store called Honey and Wine, and just as someone who used to ha work in those spaces, hanging art in those windows, to see how gorgeous this is and renovated, it just, it just completely blows my mind. But that transformation happened in under three years. Let's go on to the next slide. Is that the last slide, Mary? 
Oh, and so I just wanted to show you Turner's Falls as it was last June. So this is a sculpture at the corner. You know, there's so many different ways I could talk about, you know, talk about for this webinar things I could have brought up. This is a new sculpture by Tim De Christopher right on the corner of 3rd Street and Avenue A. But you can see the renovated block. You can see this place where we put art and we made it our own and we presented artists and and now it's been completely renovated. Um, this is just a newly renovated block that has drawn a lot of tourists, new residents, um, and also a lot of um, business investment is starting to come into town. So I think that that's all I had. Um, okay, so... Mary, do you um, have any questions for me? I do. So there are, there are a couple of things that sort of come out, step out for me. Um, one is that obviously this has been a, a sort of long-term, the progression of this um, endeavor yes. um, has taken... Has taken uh, a conversation amongst a lot of people in the room. Um, oh, absolutely. Who, if, can, you just, can you just sort of identify who, who's been involved? Sure, sure. So River Culture uh, works with the town of Montague. So I work directly with the planning department. So there's River Culture, there's the town, there's the municipality, there's downtown stakeholders, um, artists. There's been a regional influence in Franklin County, people helping us from Franklin County. Um, let's see, downtown, um, outside investment, but it's mostly downtown residents. Mostly downtown residents did this. Volunteers, business sponsors. Um, we have a, a nice group of, of sponsors that have been with River Culture the whole time, including Judge, Judd Wire and Republic Services. They continue to invest in River Culture, and then River Culture helps to bring the volunteers together that does this work. So it's been about a 12-year process. Uh, River Culture started in 2005 with the Adams Grant, but then started programming in 2006, if I've gotten that correct. So over that time, there's been about... I don't know, maybe three quarters of a million dollars in business and um, of direct support brought to River Culture, and this it, it's it's been a, it's a huge group effort. Okay, um, and one of the things that always struck me about Turner's Falls when I first visited there were um, you mentioned Chris Yankee who did the um, laundry show, but there were also sure. some other artists who'd moved into uh, Turner's Falls. Um, because they could uh, afford housing and they could afford space within the village. Um, do you want to just sort of talk about the, your relationship with them and how that's developed over time? Right. Well, we do have quite a few artists. Unfortunately, what we don't have is renovated mill space. So uh, we don't have that place in town. I'm so envious of places like East Hampton that have these giant mill bu buildings where everybody kind of can work together, can have space together. Um, we, it, it's a small town. There's 4,000 people. Most people work from their own home studio, again, because we don't have renovated space that's exclusive for, for studios. And so it's a small town, and because we are working like this, because we have to re we have to invent space, we have to be closer knit as a community, and so we do help each other. Um, River Culture works very closely with artists. Um, it's a little more difficult to <laughs> work closely with them now because what used to be my best exhibition space has now been bought and renovated, which is good for the town, but it's it's hard for me. Um, Mm -hmm. And since River Culture has been in existence for 12 years, they know that uh, if they need help or assistance, I'm there, and I can help connect them and help with opportunities. As they, are, they come to me, I can give them to the artists. So it's the size of Turner Falls and Montague in general just really lends to working like this. Okay. Um, I want to roll back to um, Food City, and in case people didn't get it, um, Food City is a supermarket, and right. the, um, the, the it was the theatre performance that took place in it was negotiated with the manager of the store. Yeah, um, I'm not sure he would do it again. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask that. I mean, why do you think they agreed to do it? 
um, on a you know over a weekend when supermarkets are typically pretty busy. What was that right. about? I, you know, I wasn't there in 2011. That would be a fantastic question for Lisa. I think she can be very persuasive. Um, okay. I, I, I think they just wanted to, to try it. I'm, I'm not really sure. I know, I know the manager of Food City. He just said yes. I, I don't know what he was expecting, um, but it was a fairly avant-garde piece, um, just mm-hmm. even based on the photos. So. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I should ask Lisa that question. How did you get that done? <laughs> Can I just ask you, you know, when you approach um, programming, um, your, your primary, what I've always understood is that your primary audience are the people that live right there. Yeah. Um, and then the people you want to attract to come into the town and spend money Absolutely. And, and, right. and go home. So when it comes to sort of thinking about program design, what, what, um, what uh, informs your decisions about what you do? Well, and then you know, the, yeah, the Avenue I storefront galleries was a no-brainer, you know, frankly, because they were empty and people walk by. People walk by with their baby strollers. People walk by on their way to school. Um, people walk by to get their, to the regular appointments. That was, to me, a really critical thing to address. Now those spaces have been renovated and it's been – um, turned into retail, which is what it was always meant to be. So, I'm left with this. I'm left with this kind of crisis of how I'm going to kind of replace that programming that really, do, really meets people where they live. We have a lot of low-income people. We have a lot of people that don't really feel comfortable um, or have a lot of background with the arts. Um, it's not something that they have thought of that's an important part of their lives. So I'm going to be turning, actually, a lot of attention to film. Um, the Shea Theater, as I've mentioned a couple of times, has gotten this beautiful renovation. And they're in the process of getting a, um, a projector that can handle the size of the room and to get a sound system so that they can show real film. Um, film is the kind of media that is easily understandable to people you know, maybe somebody wouldn't come into who lives downtown, who has lived there their whole lives, who's seen who's seen this transformation. They might not feel really comfortable going to an avant-garde performance or poetry reading, but if we're showing the right film at the Shea Theater, they will walk down the block and go into the Shea. So that is going to be the next, I think, direct way that I try to get that that the Turner Falls Cultural District, the Shea Theater, working in conjunction with River Culture, gets people into to gets people connected with art. I think I, I'm sure that film is going to be that media that does it. And again, we're working on getting that equipment in there and starting a series. And then you've also done some outdoor informal events too that have really taken off. Do you want right. to describe and a couple of those for folks? Right. So here, here, here's a little park right here. Um, it's, an, you know, it, because we don't have a lot of indoor things, we tend to do a lot of outdoor things. It really kind of racks my nerves thinking of, like a lot of other people who do outdoor events, you know, is it going to rain? Um, and so there's a little park down the street called Spinner Park, which is going to be getting about a $300,000 renovation over the next five years. But um, I will put performer, you know, put performances right there. And again, it's a way of putting it outside so people, people hear it and then they come downstairs and they see it. Um, it's a way of obviously putting it right inside of their lives. Um, we had a beautiful, um, yeah, we've had really some really great concerts over in Spinner Park. But Spinner Park has seen much better days and it really does need this renovation. But one of the things I've done in the plan and working with the town planners and, and, and getting community input from this is there's a sculpture in the middle of the park. We're going to move the sculpture to the back of the park. She's going to be highlighted, but what that gives us is about um, – that gives us a much bigger area to have small events. And when I mean, you know, it's, it's a small park. It's only about 30 feet by 30 feet, but that still is enough room to do things outside. And so we've re- in the redesign of this park, which was a really necessary thing, we made sure that it could accommodate a, a small group of people so that it was yet another place for us to do this kind of thing. But that project won't get started for 
another year and a half or two years. But it's in the it's okay. in the pipe. Then, you know, it's it's coming down the road. Okay, and then um, the last question I have for you before we I unmute everybody to ask their questions. So if you're online, um, if you could be thinking about something you want to talk about or ask Suzanne, um, it's sort of it, tell me about the the sort of your programming budget, I mean, in terms of what you have to spend on a yearly basis and what you're doing. Right. It's not a lot. It's not a lot. Um, our budget is under $50,000 a year, of which I take my salary. Um, I raise money from business sponsors, banks. Um, we have some large businesses up in the industrial park, and they give us money. But basically, let's see, I spend... About seven, seven to eight thousand dollars goes directly to artists every year. Those are mostly performers, um, but also people who give history talks and that kind of thing. Um, it is a really small budget. It's like it's under fifty thousand dollars a year, with about fifteen thousand dollars going directly, directly into programming. And most of that money, again, comes from business sponsors. Um, with the Shea Theater, there's some opportunity there to raise revenues. Um, through very, very, very low costs for programming. Up, actually, up until this point, River Cultures never asked for money at a performance. Again, we live in a community where even $5 is a lot for many people, so we do most of our programming by donations. Um, okay. And, so and, and, and so I think we get a lot for our money. I mean, we really stretch okay. this money thin, and one of the ways we can do that is because we have so many artists who are willing to give their time and energy. Okay, Volunteer so I'm going to unmute everybody. Okay, thanks, Suzanne. Sorry to interrupt you. I'm no. going to um, unmute everybody that's online, and we have someone with a hand raised at the moment, Tony Fusillo from, um, from uh, Provincetown. The conference Tony, has been unmuted. Okay, yes, so I have can... a question. Oh, okay. um, thank you for thank you for your presentation. I do have a question because we just spoke about budget, and yeah. you said it's less than fifty. Do you receive any funding from the town? Yes. So that's funny that you mentioned that. <laughs> um, we we got our Adams grant, which was discontinued last year, and then we had um, then I would raise money to our sponsors, and then the town would kick in. Um, to kind of meet our matching grant. It was anywhere from about $6,000. I think a high one year um, when River Culture just got started was closer to $20,000. So the, the town does kind of bridge a, a, a small amount of money. The, that money was a discretionary fund at the municipality. So River Culture has never been like a line item, budget item at the town of Montague. And now that the Adams grant has been discontinued, um, I'm working with the town planner to position the river culture program inside the planning department. And fingers crossed on that one to kind of take, um, which everyone would agree is a very successful program, and make a cultural coordinator uh, a permanent town position. I mean, it's quite a hurdle to get over. So it's, it is kind of, in my opinion, and in the opinion of many others, time for the town to understand the value of this kind of programming and to make it a permanent position to really pay for it outright every year. So that's kind of where river culture is in terms of their financial relationship with the town. Other questions from anyone else online? Um, I, in that case, um, I have a question. Um, so so um, when you're making decisions about the artists you want to present, are you presenting local artists primarily? Um, how does that work? Mostly local artists. And, you know, I work 25 hours a week, give or take. It's a part-time position. And so I kind of have a, a, a squeaky wheel you know, like the person that comes to me, I try to do as much outreach as possible. But really, the people that approach to me, they approach me. They say, "Well, I have this kind of art. I'd like to present this. I have an idea for a play. 
Um, I had somebody come to me and they said oh, they love vinyl records and their friends have vinyl records and they want to have a vinyl record fair. I'm like, absolutely. So they, the ideas tend to come to me, but they are mostly local. They are mostly people, I would say, within 15 miles of Montague. Not exclusively, but all, most of the time. Most of the time. So I make my programming. I have ideas. I listen to the community. People tell me what they want. And then when ideas come to me, I try to take that idea and maybe wrap it into an, um, maybe wrap it into some programming that I was thinking of also thinking of doing, or putting artists together and having in a, a, a larger event, which is very often the case. Okay, and I, one of the things you mentioned earlier was that you either are doing programming where they're likely to make some money because they're uh, in a vendor situation, or that you're paying them for the work that they're doing. So you're creating mm -hmm. you're creating a marketplace essentially. Right. Is that is that tr is that the case? Well, um, yes, I, I do. I do pay performers. Um, I do pay artists. I pay, I pay. I pay as many people as possible because they don't get paid very often for the things that they do. Um, they have all this talent, and it is great if you get to put your art up in in in, um, re in restaurants, you know, to decorate the walls in that kind of sense. But also, people need to be paid. I just feel very strongly that if it's something that I can do, I try to get people a little bit of money, um, a small stipend for a history talk, things like that. Um, so I do, I, money definitely goes out, and I put as much money directly into artists as possible. Um, again, because many of them don't, you know, many of them are just doing this because they love it, but that's still not an excuse to not pay them for their time and talent. Okay, and then we've got two questions. Um, Tony, um, go ahead. We'll have another question, and then Rachel. Tony? So, Mike, I have another question. Are you a membership organization? No, no. So you are no, a five hundred one c three. No, we're not. So we're we're in the You're municipality, not. and okay. yeah. So we work we work with the town of Montague. So no, we're not yeah. a five hundred one c three. When it comes to, for example, getting grants and things from foundations, what I very often do is I am paired with a partner who is a legitimate 501c3. Like I work on, um, I work f uh, with the Nolan Beaker Project on the Pocumtock Homelands Festival, which as I cited in one of my earlier slides is a, a fab fabulous Native American event down um, on the waterfront on the Connecticut River. So uh, by working with them, we might go in for a grant together to pay for their performers, but they're you know a legitimate 501c3, so the money goes through them. So that's so kind of that's you're kind actually of how an employee of the town. Then is that right? I am a contractor for the town of Montague, and we are trying to make me a town employee, you know, full stop. But right now, I'm an, I'm an independent contractor, and I get two-year contracts with the town. Thank you. I will add to that that what we've seen happen over um, time um, with positions like this is that they start off as a contractor position, and then um, when the you know when there are so clear results and the town is confident that this work will continue and is relevant, then um, then the position is absorbed, or there is a right. position created as a cultural development um, officer. And we've seen that happen in a number of communities. If anyone online wants to have a conversation with me about that or talk to somebody where that's been the case, then please feel free to get in contact with me. Rachel, I believe you had a question. Yes, I did. Uh, I'm from the Mid-Cape Cultural Council, which is the towns of Yarmouth and Barnstable on Cape Cod. Yeah. And we're in a very culturally rich area from an organizational standpoint. We are dense with organizations that are providing cultural activities. But one of the challenges we're finding as a council is getting the word out and drawing the audience to our events. And I'm wondering if you might have any special tips on that or ideas that have been really successful for you. We're, of course, leveraging 
Facebook and the town websites as well as partnering with other cultural organizations, but any insights you might have would be really valuable. Hmm. Sounds like we're doing the same things. You know, social media is very big for river culture only because it's so inexpensive. Mm -hmm. As you know, placing an ad in a newspaper might cost $250, but placing $50 in front of a Facebook Hello. event, you know, you could reach just as many people. Um, let's see. I mean, I don't know if I – it sounds like you're doing everything right, but you're having problems getting people to your events? Yes, yeah. Uh, when when, when are they mostly? Could it, could it be that there's just too much going on so there's too much competition? I, I do think that that could actually be a big piece of it. Uh, I don't, one I don't of do our summer annual programs. events is our grants reception, which we're really trying to raise the profile of the organization and our grantees. Right. And uh, it's unless it's often just the grantees and friends and family of them that attend, even though we send an invitation list about 300 individuals uh, from other cultural organizations and local representatives and what have you. Right. It, it, maybe you just have too much going on. For example, um, we have we have a, a huge music festival, the Green River Music Festival, that happens, and then there's music festivals in Western Massachusetts all summer long. I absolutely mm -hmm. do not plan anything when those things are going on because everybody's over there. I mean, we are in such a rural population that I have to really look and see when attendance, when there aren't any events. I'm working with a man named uh, Paul Richmond, who is a poet, and he has been doing this word festival, and he, do, he did it in October successfully in Turner's Falls. But I said if he did it in March, we'd get twice the crowd because nothing is going on in March. So I don't have any advice for you other than to maybe get together with, maybe get together with pe other people who do cultural programming and, and see when they're working and maybe come to an agreement yeah, so that we're not um, overlapping like, enough. So you're not overlapping. Um, I do that out here in Western Massachusetts with um, Shelburne Falls, with um, um, Carmela in Shelburne Falls, with Lisa Duvall, who's at the Franklin County Chamber, who used to have my job. You know, because we're rural, you know, especially around the holidays, we're all just trying to fight for those 500 people to show up. <laughs> and so we say, okay, so on the calendar, this is Turner's Falls uh, holiday event, and then Greenfield's holiday event is seven days later, and then Northfield does theirs. And we sit together and we, we, we divvy this out just because we realize that if we're all going on the same day, all of us are going to suffer because it's just so rural. Mm -hmm. So that's the only that's advice I can give you is to try to make, try to f figure out who's also doing the programming and maybe meeting with them every, you know, every couple months with your calendars and saying this is, like how, how can we make sure we all get people to show up? Excellent point. Thank you. I think the other thing about this is, is also, um, you know, we've reached a, a point with our audiences where, there, where there's a great deal of sort of, in, there's so much information, it creates a lot of confusion in people's minds and it makes it more difficult for them to make choices. So right. certainly um, putting information, certainly in terms of social media, whatever it is you're using, whether or not it's Instagram or Twitter or you know, it's worth thinking about when do people make decisions about um, what they're going to do, say that weekend, right. that week, or whatever. So, and, right. Um, and if you can sort of hit that, um, then then you're better able to have a, a plan to be able to post things in a way that's logical for the people that are um, that are trying to find information. You know, the fact of the matter is in Massachusetts that from the, a tourism point of view, but a visitor point of view, um, a lot of people stay home from sort of November through to March. So it gives us an opportunity to really focus on um, the local population and surrounding right. communities right. In, a, in a really dynamic way, I think. Um, right. It, you know, um, and being able to figure out where they get information is also sort of really key to this. Where do you need to place information to make sure that it's in front of people? And what's the messaging behind that, um, that that you want to put out there? Are you getting across what the program really is? And are, is the invitation a really open one for the people really right in front of you, which is in part what the session is about? Suzanne, you talked about 
community input a couple of times. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the relationship with the community a little bit? It's, yeah, I'll, so I'll give you an example of Spinner Park, which is a park that I alluded to that's going to be getting this uh, really beautiful renovation in a few years, and the same park in which the sculpture that's in the middle of the tiny little park is going to be moved to the back, highlighted, but moved to the back so that we can accommodate more outdoor venues. Um, it is, is, a project, is a project by the town of Montague. Um, I was enlisted by the town planner to get community input, uh, moving the sculpture um, it's a very beloved sculpture. It's kind of a big deal. And so we wanted to make sure that it was okay. We wanted to make sure that people liked this idea. Um, in the past, we've done in-person meetings, um, which don't really come off very well. I, I, I hate to say it because not everybody feels comfortable coming to town hall and going into a meeting. Um, not everybody feels comfortable voicing their opinion um, in person. Not every, obviously, not everyone has time. So I put together, um, it was a Facebook post. It was incredibly successful. I think it was shared 18 times, but it had four plans of the park, all of them with, um, all, all of them with slight changes. So this was the park, you know, should we renovate the park and make the design exactly as is? Should we renovate the park but make a few small changes? And then the third plan, it was three plans, was the one that moved the sculpture to the back. And I drew them all out, and I asked for a vote, and I asked for comments. And I think I had close to 7,000 people see that post. And I had almost 200 comments in which the third moving the sculpture was preferred five to one. So it was re a really and, – and I never would have gotten that kind of input had I done it in person. Um, so there are some times when social media is the way to go, and then there are other times where just being in your community, you know, it's such a small community, and everybody knows me. I wear this bright green jacket. I get stopped everywhere I go. And I keep a, a mental list and sometimes write down people's, what people tell me. And it's more, it's, like more, it's more like community input is cumulative. So this idea of doing a strong film series came from comments over the last four years. You know, a couple in the spring, a couple in the fall. Why aren't there movies at the Shea? People ask me. And the answer was because we didn't have a projector, a, a, you know, a, a good projector at least. And, and so sometimes community <laughs> input is, is cumulative. And sometimes it's really direct. Like pick, pick a plan, A, B, or C. And it's about knowing, it's about knowing what – it's about knowing – the best way to go about a particular circumstance. It's not like you can do the same thing every time. Can you say so? So you follow your instinct? Is that just you know? Is that just there's, uh, there, there, there's definitely a lot of intuition um, with public input, but depending on the project, depending what I'm trying to get public input around, dictates how it is that I do it. Sometimes, okay. you know, it is just better to set up a table at Pumpkin Fest and have a form and ask people a few questions and get the input that way. And sometimes it's calling people on the phone and asking them. Sometimes it's, you know, person to person on the street. Sometimes it's a Facebook post. And then sometimes it is an in-person meeting where it's, um, you know, the, where town hall announces that you're going to have a meeting and talk about a particular subject. But I have found social media very um, I, I have found it to be a really good resource for collecting community input. Is there anything you've done, Suzanne, that, that has led to some unexpected results? As far as community input? As far as community input or some of the programming that you've done that, that you know, that, that, that was well received or not well received or that you you know, decide not to do again? Oh, of, uh, a flop? I'll tell you a flop. So I was doing, okay. um, it was this time last year, I was doing a music and diversity event. So it's an event that we have in February or March. Um, I tend to like things in March because it's less likely to have snow. But I wanted to involve um, a community organization called La Mariposa, which is a community um, of people of color led and focused community group right in Turner's Falls. Unfortunately, I did not take I did not take into uh, consideration 
their schedule. I'm used to doing things very quickly. I'm used to dealing with professional event planners and people who do this do things very quickly. And when I approached them, they felt like I did not give them enough time and they were unwilling to work on that at that schedule. So I moved the I moved the whole idea back 6 weeks and that gave them time to fully participate. So that was like a community input, community involvement flop. I thought everyone can move at the speed of light, which was, you know, how I'm used to working. And in fact, they wanted to be in earlier, you know, in the planning process earlier, and they wanted to have more time to make decisions, um, not and, and and be more involved. And so that was a big flop. And the way I handled it was giving them the time, and we had a fantastic event eventually. But you know, it was egg in my face for sure. Okay. And and what about the reverse of that? When you've done something that's just got taken off, like gangbusters in a way that oh, you wouldn't a, have. Well, a, a funny advertising thing. We have Family Fish Day, which happens at the Discovery Center. It's not a river culture event. It's a DCR event, but it is a really really fun event. And I was participating and told them I would do a little advertising for them. So I happen to know that Northfield Mountain, which owns uh, you know, First Light, which has all of the, you know, owns the river, owns the dam, I happen to know they had a giant fish costume, a, a, a giant embarrassing fish costume. So I got a friend of mine who's a fantastic photographer. I went and borrowed the fish costume, and I went all around town in funny locations, and in about two hours we got half a dozen maybe 10 really humorous photos of me in this fish costume in the food store and in the laundromat folding laundry and down at the waterfront and, you know, just doing all these silly things. And it was like a two-hour – we got this material for an advertising campaign together. It took two hours. I paid the photographer $50. Um, instead of hiring a graphic designer for a post or anything. And we just had a series of really silly posts about fishing. And it and it really took off, and it took two hours of my time and time and fifty dollars. And it's because I happen to know there was this ridiculous costume that I could borrow. But that is where a lot of my programming decisions come from, which is what materials do I have that I can beg, borrow, and steal? Because that's just the nature of what you know, the financial nature of river culture <laughs> is. You know, oh, you've got a fish costume. I'm going to use the fish costume, and I did, and it came off great. That sounds like fun. I wish I'd um, I wish I'd been on the street for that one. Um, tell me something. You you um, obviously there are these new businesses, creative businesses, restaurants, and so on in the theatre. You know, their venues that are now open and looking for business. Do you? Um, what do you do to sort of promote what they're doing as well? Um, if if sure. they're doing anything, if they're doing anything special in you know, again, it's it's in person. It's an in person relationship. All this stuff, all of this stuff I do for these businesses starts with relationship. So I start to get to know the people who own these businesses and let them know that hey, I'm here to help you. If you're doing anything, give me a call, shoot me an email, um, send me a link, and I'll make sure that I'll make sure that. I get it out there the best that I can. Sometimes that means being put into the monthly newsletter. Sometimes, very often, that means being hooked up with social media. Um, like our last presenter last week, I try to post uh, twice a week, not more than three times a week. And every Thursday I have a Facebook post, what's going on in Montague, what's going on in Turner's Falls this weekend. comes out on Thursday afternoon. Um, it's usually my highest um, – um, clicked on Facebook post, but people now know to contact me if they want to get in on that post. And then, of course, I have a website that does the same thing. So a lot of advertising, a lot of connecting, connecting um, reasons to come to Turner's Falls for a weekend. This, this, this is a special going on in a restaurant. This is, you know, the pinball gallery is open, and then there's a show at the show that night. How fun is that? It's a whole, it's a whole evening. It's all planned out. So, um, but what I mostly do is to keep good, strong relationships with the people of businesses downtown. That's like first and paramount. Okay. And um, any other questions for Suzanne from anybody on the online right now?
If not, I think we're going to wrap this up. I want to thank, thank Dan for um, for presenting this this morning. I, I know that this opens up a lot of questions. Um, from our perspective, one of the things that we see is that um, business to business, whether or not it's a cultural organization, a gallery, a restaurant, or an antique store, whatever it is, you know, we we think the more that we can create linkage between these businesses, the more able people are to be able to see what there is on offer and then make choices. Um, and we encourage you to think that through. I think itineraries also work if you're trying to get people in. Um, but the point that Dan made about sitting down and meeting with people on a regular basis to sort out actually who's doing what and how, and then you, how you can co-brand um, what you're doing in the in your particular community just is a, a smart way to go. We are recording um, this session and we will be sending it out to everybody. Um, so please feel free to share it. Um, the next convo will be on um, February 28th. We will be sending out a notice about that. And then the last thing I want to add is if you haven't yet registered for the Mass Cultural Council Institute, please do so. I know we're going to be end up being limited for space. Um, we'd like a, as high a turnout as possible for that. So if you haven't got information, I think you have an email from me so you know how to reach me. Um, please feel free um, uh, to ask me any questions about it. Thank you so much for taking the time out to join us this morning. And thank, thank you. you again to Suzanne. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye.